Um, I do want to welcome everyone formally to today's session. Um, and uh, at the timing, of course, the title is Three Institutions Supporting Science in the SDGs or Sustainable Development Goals. Um, but uh, today's discussion really will focus around uh, uh, what the various institutions uh, are doing um, to uh, support science and, uh, and really getting a sense of what the crystal ball looks like from each of the speakers uh, going forward. Um, you know, the, the challenge is, is that uh, 20 years ago, we were talking about what uh, climate change may look like. It was all kind of future tense. Uh, we're now looking at the, the realities. And so uh, there's no sense of, of, of solutions, but it's a matter of prioritizing uh, resources and, and our speakers today will discuss some of that. Um, I'm gonna share some links in the chat rather than spending a whole lot of time uh, on uh, introductions, but uh, I would like to have our two first speakers uh, from the Stimson Center, uh, David Bray and Sharon McPherson uh, begin the discussion and uh, uh, David and Sharon, over to you, please. Thank you. Well, uh, appreciate it, Aaron, and it's great to be here with Sharon. Uh, Sharon's a longtime friend and is doing great work with what's called the Green Jobs Machine, which we hope to dive a little bit more in. Um, also, for folks that are online, if you have questions or comments that you want to chime in with the chat, feel free to please use them. Uh, we want to make this as interactive as possible. And really what Sharon and I are going to do is sort of set the scene um, for then uh, a deeper dive uh, by Lynn, followed by Eric, as we consider what we can do to tackle um, the challenges of climate change and how we can think of both local solutions and global solutions uh, that, are, that are done through a community-centric lens. So I'm going to first go to you, Sharon, and, and sort of tee up. Um, you know, you've been flying the flag for this activity called the Green Jobs Machine. Um, if you could begin with the why, and, and maybe we'll do a little bit more into the what and the how after that, but why is this important? And, and why is it that we should be talking about both jobs and being green in the same context? Um, I love the question, David. And I think um, actually John has kicked us off really well in the chat. <laughs> and he talked about the fact that startups are a key path to making significant progress on the SDGs. And I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and so I have spent most of my um, career living and working um, in the area of place-based economic development, primarily in the emerging world. And um, over the last two years, I've done a lot of high-level policy work in the United States, looking at the intersectionality between climate, national security, and, um, uh, and infrastructure. Um, and, you know, I, I came to a similar conclusion, to the conclusion that John made. Right. I reached it. I, 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 you know, I, I sat in Washington, D.C. and I said, we have great policies, but there are not a lot of people here who know how to actually like create jobs. Right. Create sustainable, quality, green jobs because they're not cheap to create. Right. And so how do we do that? And so really, the green jobs machine grew out of um uh, the experience that I had as an, as an international foreign policy advisor and the work, which has been my life's work. Um, and it really is all about how do we leverage science and technology to get it right. Um, and so we can go deeper into what it is that we're trying to solve for, but it really is about measurable impact, place-based and kind of at the four, at the coal face of climate change in those communities where um, that are bear bearing really the first and the worst. Let's get it right there first, because, um, you know, there are dire consequences for all of us when we fail to 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 really address um, survivability. And then we can talk about sustainability, because I know the SDGs are are part of what we need to dig into. Very well said, Sharon. And I really liked how you set the scene that that it is the idea that we can actually you know, the best way to predict the future is to create the future. We can create the future through startups, um, startups that are appropriate for the local level and that can scale to the global level. Because like you said, it's not like we can get off a plane and, and go to West Virginia and tell them immediately they're going to stop doing coal. I mean, they've been doing it for generations, but we can talk about things that are greener with what they're currently doing. And then maybe talk about the future of mining being something that's not, not as toxic. Uh, maybe it's using bacteria or things like that. Um, sure. Because even in the U.S.'s rush for electronic vehicles, EVs, 
uh, we still have a lot to do to make both lithium as well as the rare earth minerals extraction uh, less toxic. Um, so that, you know, while we celebrate on one hand going to EVs, uh, that's really just the start. And so that's where a role of startups that are appropriate to the local context. If I could ask you an additional follow-up, um, can you talk a little bit more about the behavioral part at the local level and how do you approach it with empathy and understanding for whatever the local context is in trying to be more green? We actually started there. So about 20, probably about 20 years ago, we were way ahead of the market. And we actually started looking at technologies that have been developed by the US Army War College. And, and so for those of you who may not know, um, the US military is very good with behavior tech. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> We're really good at breaking down belief systems and, you know, and across age and gender and race and you name it. So we're really good with behavior tech. And believe it or not, most um, at its core, you know, behavior tech really grew out of military science. And so we really went back and we started looking at how do you have people have a mindset shift? Because if you're going to talk about place based economic development, and I know, David, we've had debates about resilience, you know, as jargon, but I'm a huge fan of the Stimson Center's Alliance for a Climate Resilient Earth, and I, I support that work. And I truly believe that resilience, by the way, underpins every sustainable development goal. But if you go back and you look at the history of resilience training and the connectedness to behavior tech, it grew out of military science. And we went back and we started looking at this stuff and said, well, how do you help people break down belief systems so that they can actually develop a different mindset because it's going to be needed in this new normal that we're, we're you know, so if you're talking about Hurricane Alley or going and looking at what's happening in Kentucky or dealing with the folks who are dealing, you know, who are being subject to, you know, hurricane storms in Florida, right? You got to have a, a certain kind of mindset that enables you to survive long enough to become sustainable. Mm -hmm. So I really am about investing and in, in leveraging everything that's in our arsenal, including behavior tech, in order to help people to um, be stronger in tough environments, because I believe that's what that's what's needed now. And it's and what's that's what's increasingly going to be needed as we go forward. Really love that as well, Sharon. And, and I think, yeah, as you said, you and I have, have had some discussions about de-jargonizing resilience. Do we mean it's simply bouncing back the same way or is it bouncing back in a better way? Um, you know, as we see what's happened with Hurricane Ian, uh, Ian, you know, it's awful what's happened in Florida and other places, but hopefully there's also some thought about how do you make sure that if a future hurricane goes through, it's not just the same thing over again, but it's actually something that's different, better, both from a, 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 a um, human survivability and thrivability standpoint, mm -hmm. as well as a green standpoint. And so mm -hmm. one last question, and then we'll pivot to Lynn, because I want to be respectful of, of, of folks uh, getting their different uh, viewpoints across. Um, you know, you're very implementation focused. And at the Simpson Center, we're the same way, that, that we, we like to not just write a paper about it, we actually like to do things about it. And so if you were to tee up maybe one or two things that folks, if they wanted to learn more about the Green Smart Jobs Machine and actually do something about it. Um, I recognize, you know, there, there, it, it depends partly on local context and circumstance and who the people are, but do you have possibly one or two action-oriented steps to begin that journey uh, that you would recommend for people? Yeah, I would say, first of all, sign up for um, our newsletter because we're going to be um, increasingly putting out, uh, you know, newsletters and, and, and information about how you can become part of, of the network. And then what I would also suggest in terms of, and this is not just about you know, uh, supporting the green jobs machine, but I would also um, ask everyone um, on this platform to get clear about what place-based economic development really means and, and how this whole move towards, well, we'll talk about how to better define resilience and get rid of the jargon, but we have to get serious about understanding what is required for us to survive long enough to become sustainable? And the last thing I'll say, David, because I know we've got some, some super smart people on the line that we wanna talk about, coming back to science and coming back to technology and what we're doing to support the sustainable development goals, because that's, that's part of the reason why we're on the call today, um, is you know there are some weaknesses baked into how we have actually defined 
you know, how do we want to measure these goals? The other problem that we have that I think the green jobs machine is certainly tackling is understanding not just the taxonomy, but the ontology. What is the interconnectedness between the goals? What's the hierarchy? How do we get the data right? So you mentioned community-centric data, um, and a lot of that's missing. And so part of what we're doing at the Green Jobs Machine is we're leveraging, um, whether it's space technology, right? right? Um, clearly AI, um, you know, predictive analytics, IoT, mobile, 5G, cloud, um, uh, et cetera, to really begin to aggregate data that needs to be aggregated and more importantly, translate that data so that it facilitates better human decision making. But then closing that loop to understand the implementation and the practices related to those measurable outcomes. It's very weak in the SDG measurement framework. It's a big challenge. And I think that that's one of the biggest and I think most important ways that the Green Jobs Machine, as well as some of the work that we do at the Stimson Center, can close that gap, that loop because I think it's a big one. And I think it's, it's, I don't think it's a fatal flaw, but I definitely think it's a flaw in how we've conceptualized the SDGs and we've got to get it right if we, if we want to realize these goals, so. Love it. And, and if, I, if I'm correct, I believe the website for the Green Jobs Machine is www.phdgjm. That's yep. B-P-H-E, G is in green, G is in jobs, yep. M is in machine.com. Um, yep. But thank you very much for that, Sharon, and, and very well said about thinking about how we can do community-centric data, um, because we know there's there's things coming online in terms of data from space, data from uh, other observations, uh, mobile phone data. How can we make sure that's both respectful of individual choice and privacy, but also that that folks have equity in the data at the local level, that it's not just hoovered up at the global level. That's right. So with that, um, now we're going to 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 pivot um, to to Lynn Wells, who is a good friend. And so, Dr. Lynn Wells, if you could now sort of address for us the next level of okay, so what are some of the things that we should be thinking about as we move into this space? And I'll go over to you, uh, over to you, Lynn. So I think uh, some of the things to be sure how, how would you engage with the communities, and specifically. So I'm dealing with experiences here through George Mason University's Center for Resilient and Sustainable Communities, as also some of the experiences the People's Center Internet has had with the um, Internet Society's Foundation and working in Native American communities, plus some of our work in Puerto Rico and in Appalachia. And I think one of the approaches that's important is to take a design thinking approach to this, if you will. And we've tried to institutionalize this. First of all, what is the problem? And that begins by just shutting up and listening to what your stakeholders are trying to tell you about what's important to them. And then there's a question about where do you get the resources? And in many cases, just for example, as an example, as a current model, there's enormous amounts of money out there for broadband <clears throat> resources, tens of billions of dollars. But it comes from different organizations. It comes from different purposes. I mean, some is from the FCC, some is from the Department of Agriculture, some is from state government, some is for education, some is for, uh, you know, for telemedicine. And for anyone not completely immersed in this world to figure out what the grant, you know, processes are, what the due dates, the applications are, is almost impossible. How do you figure it to make it easier for to find the resources? Then the question is, how do you govern it? Is it tribal law? Is it state law? Is it federal regulation? Only then do you really get to the technology. And lots of times people come in and say, oh, there's a technology problem by my system, you put it make some metrics, so on and so forth. That's not the issue. <clears throat> but then finally, once you get people with laptops on the kitchen table, uh, is how do you sustain it? How do you maintain it? How do you keep them from turning into inert masses of silicon and plastic in six months because they didn't do the patches? So we're trying to work with um, local educators to develop cadres, for example, teen and tween advocates uh, who can actually maintain the system and help articulate the importance of these to their families. So that kind of those sort of five uh, parts are important ways to engage. Let me just make two more points. One is the importance of uh, nothing about us without us. 
uh, basically, if you just walk into a system and say, here's the answer, uh, it's just not going to take. So how do you see that the systems are co-developed, the solutions are co-developed with the people who have to live with them, point one. And the other point is trusted interlocutors. You've got to find people who are trusted by the communities they'll be dealing with and how they can be your interfaces from outside experts, if you will, uh, in order to make sure this uh, solution is safe. Over. So Lynn, if, if I could ask a follow on, because you were talking about how to like address the fact that there's different fundings. One, could you share a little bit about what the People Center Internet, because I know that's near and dear to your heart, and then maybe share a little bit about also what you've done, obviously, with Star Tides, and, and maybe sort of, um, in some respects, help people understand how this, this operates in, in a um, practical context. I mean, People Center Internet is looking at the fact that as we bring the next half of the world's population roughly online, how can it be an environment that promotes uh, the needs of people rather than governments and corporations. Uh, and how do you get to issues like digital public goods? How do you get to issues like uh, online funding for small and medium-sized enterprises? Uh, how can you uh, can bring people online who have not been exposed to what the digital community needs opportunities to be out there? Um, so I think uh, with regard to Center for Resilient and Sustainable Communities, we mentioned Star Tides. Uh, Star Tides tries to, is, is a global knowledge sharing network that has people with expertise in several different areas, such as power, shelter, water, food, comms, health, transportation. What CRASP does is let you focus on individual communities. So instead of going in and say, I want to build a well, or I want to uh, build a bridge, or I want to develop a school, you try to think about all these different infrastructures holistically uh, and apply them to the problems uh, of the community. Excellent. And so one last follow-up, and, and if there's something else that you'd also like to address, let me know. But one last follow-up before I go to a uh, friend and colleague, Dr. Eric Rasmussen. So Lynn, I mean, you obviously have seen things from multiple perspectives, from, from being in government, uh, from being with the different nonprofits, including those you helped found, uh, from the private sector. Uh, there was a comment in the chat that I think John raised, which is, this is not to say that policy doesn't matter. Policy does matter, but it's not enough. And in a world that's changing so fast, do you have ideas as to how we can wed policy, which is by itself insufficient for what we need to do to address climate change, with what's the reality on the ground in terms of both the changing the changing world in terms of natural world, um, but also geopolitics, as we've seen unprecedented geopolitics in the last year, and we may see even more unprecedented geopolitics in 2023? So if you think many of these as being, if you will, wicked problems or complex problems. Uh, one of the elements of a wicked problem is that it's the amalgam of many other different kinds of problems. So as soon as you try to start to solve it, you're changing the problem. And so I think a really important way of addressing these is to write down your going in assumptions. Uh, this is what we would like to see, you know, the Iraqis will greet us with open arms across the border, whatever the going in assumptions are. Um, and then when you choose a course of action, uh, schedule a review, six months, a year, whatever. And is, in fact, that course of action converging to where you want? Now, in choosing that course of action, you probably will have rejected several others. And during that review, you say, well, maybe course of action C would have been better than course of action B. But before you do that, there are two really important leadership steps to take. The first is to get with your own leadership and get them to buy into the fact that if you do this review and it's necessary to change, that's a sign of weakness, a sign of strength, not a sign of weakness. And the same thing is to get to your own team and say, okay, we're gonna devote heart and soul to plan of action B, but if the review shows that's not right, then we're going to change and I ask for your support and uh, moving out in the new direction. So I think um, you're right, the policies are changing, the world is changing. You know, Tom Friedman talks about the age of accelerations. Great, but again, I find that to find the opening criteria and the underlying criteria and then review and get buy-in for making adjustments as needed is one way to approach it. 
Love it. And, and, and clearly that's born from some really great leadership experiences you have had um, in that you have to recognize that at a certain point in time, you can't wait for perfect information. You have to make a decision. But like you said, being willing to revisit it because the world continues to change as it is. It is a wicked problem. So thank you for that, Lynn. Uh, now we'll go to friend and colleague, Dr. Eric Rasmussen uh, for his remarks. Uh, and then after Eric, please, again, continue to chime in with your questions, because after Eric does his uh, discussion and presentation, we will circle to your questions. Questions, uh, from the audience. But first, over to you, Dr. Eric Rasmussen. A pleasure. Thank you very much, David. It's good to be here, and it's good to have everybody contributing in the chat. The stuff that I'm hearing from John Seacrest is, is, is really strong, and I look forward to that. Um, we're going to be addressing some of those over time. Mm -hmm. I'm here as a, first of all, do you hear any echo coming to this? Are you doing okay? Good. Um, so we have a long list of things that you've just heard that are extremely valuable for how you move forward in getting these things done in the world. Part of what I want to talk about here is one of those places that is just now coming online that might be helpful for getting these kinds of things done in the world. I'm going to share my screen. Um, it is a location over my shoulder here. Um, the Marshall Islands have Kwajalein Atoll. Kwajalein Atoll has 94 islands around it. One of those islands is called Ebai. And on Ebai, we are building something called the Kwajalein Atoll Sustainability Laboratory. And I'm going to share my screen here and make sure that you can see what it is that I have up. Is it up? We Good. see you. Copy. So thank you. So um, what you see there is a, a representative of the population that's on Kwajalein, um, much more than half probably as much as 62, 63% are under age 15, not under age 18. And they're in a very difficult place. Um, they're out as one of the island states in the Pacific. And as you can see, those are generally divided into three large clumps. But by and large, all of those clumps have unusual languages. They have low density languages. They have a lot of people. They're very poor. They're highly vulnerable to climate change. And a part of what they're worried about right now is the fact that, that geopolitically, they have enormous economic exclusion zones around those islands. Therefore, geopolitically, they're very desirable if there is going to be competition in the Pacific. The U.S., um, as one example, has moved some resources into the Pacific to try to counter some of the geopolitical pressures. China, of course, has has some geopolitical advances that they are making. And in the contending, there are some things that are very difficult for the people who actually live there. So it seemed to be a good place to go to address some of the issues. Here is one of those places that I just mentioned, Ebai Island, and it is kind of a quintessential example of human insecurity in the 21st century. This is a drone shot looking up and the atoll goes north as you're looking to the north here and curves around in a circle. And as I mentioned, there are 94 islands. Um, that particular island has a lot of issues associated with it. Um, and this is what they look like pre-COVID. Um, things went downhill during the COVID years because they are so far from everywhere. And more than 80% of all of the calories con uh, consumed on Eba Island has to come in from the outside. When global shipping is profoundly disrupted, that becomes an issue. All of these things that you see over on the left-hand side of your screen, things that happen with water. Water actually comes from freshwater aquifers under most of these islands. The ones that are uninhabited are usually uninhabited because they don't have an aquifer. They have power and fuel fragility. They have limitations in healthcare because not only do they have a lot of disease processes, both infectious and non-infectious, they are very limited in the amount of care that they can deliver. One of the most senior people on this island got ill and had to be evacuated all the way up to the United States because no place along the way had the kind of care that he required. And he wound up getting quite ill before he could get as far as he needed to get. They have a lot of people in a small place. There are about 12 to 14,000 people. Nobody's quite sure how many on this island. And that island is small. There is huge levels of unemployment on Ebay, about 70%. Um, the older generation is aware that they may be sacrificing all of the islands that they've lived on for the last 4,000 years over the next 50 years, and the younger generation is terrified by that. They are very well aware of the threats that they face. And of course, in that impending diaspora, there are all kinds of challenges that they are just beginning to face. Fortunately, there are some very strong, intelligent, and 
progressive leadership in the sense of recognizing reality um, on the uh, within the political structure um, of the Marshall Islands in general, Kwajalein Atoll in particular. And this is Senator Kiplang Gabor. When we began talking with her in 2019, um, as Minister of Education, she um, was extremely supportive of the idea that something needed to be done to show the Marshallese what possibilities existed in the world, because yeah. not knowing what could help means that you don't have enough to choose from. Um, we began engaging with the Marshallese at a ground level, and she in turn shifted from Minister of Education to her new position as Minister of Foreign Affairs, and she is representing the Marshall Islands in negotiations, among other things, about where Marshallese might go as their future hits them in the face. There is, in addition to the elected leadership, the democratic leadership, there is a traditional leadership. That indigenous leadership is led by this man, Kalima Kaboa. Um, he is the crown prince, um, and he will be taking over within a very few years. He is well-educated. He is very curious. He is very active in desiring the best possible resolution of the care that's going to be required for his people over his working lifetime. Um, he recognizes that what he is facing is something that General George Marshall was talking about in his Harvard talk that led to the Marshall Plan way back when, um, and his hunger and poverty and desperation and chaos that he is facing in his islands are things that he wants to move forward to begin to address as soon as possible. So they brought a, a team of people in, I was one of them, to look at those who were on Ebay Island. And one of the first things that we recognized as we worked with them on a demographic survey was that there were no addresses for these 10, 12, 13, 14,000 people on the island. A lot of the housing was informal and there were no addresses. So if somebody needed to be localized or if something needed to be recognized as a valuable attribute, it wasn't possible in any system that they had currently in play um, to define where that was for everybody's understanding. We began working with a tool called What Three Words, which is a free, let me say that again, free, free, free application, Android and iOS, um, that can assign a three word definition to every 10 square foot patch on the planet. 57 trillion squares have been assigned in every single corner of the globe. And those turn out to be extremely useful for people that cannot easily use GPS coordinates. You can see that in the queuing for the viewing of the queen lying in state in the UK uh, last week, there was a what three words app that allowed people to understand where they were in the queue for where they needed to be. Um, that was what we brought into Kwajalein. And on eBuy, we did a demographic survey that showed things like this. There you see some what three words results from just the central district where we sampled about 1,200 people, found about half of them were under age 18, so by UN definition, children. And we found that a lot of people had unrecognized issues that needed to be addressed. A quarter of all households had an illness or an injury that had not been treated in any sense. A third of them had no access to clean water, and that was more than the um, Kwajalein Atoll government had expected. And some people had accumulated people from outer islands that had in-migrated without anybody being aware of that, and one household had 42 people in it. So they asked from that demographic survey, could we do something better? And we began looking at what might be possible and decided that something uh, called a Kwajalein Atoll Sustainability Laboratory, bringing all of the resources that we possibly could to be tested by the Marshallese would be something highly desirable and would have ramifications elsewhere in the world for other low elevation coastal zone peoples, whether they be South Pacific Islanders or in Mumbai or Montevideo or any of Manila. Um, so that resulted in a paper that we put together and presented at IEEE defining what that might look like, and that's going into place right now. And I'm going to take a moment to recognize that the Franklin Roosevelt speech back in the State of the Union in 1941 is the kind of thing, freedom from want, freedom from fear, that the Marshallese want to achieve for their people. And so they have built 
a nonprofit of their own. This is not an outside nonprofit. This is not a U.S. nonprofit. It's a Marshallese nonprofit. It is focused on climate adaptation because they have no methods for mitigation. They know that they may have to leave these islands where they have been for 4,000 years. So what we are doing is bringing in things that can be tested to see if they might be something that can improve some aspect of Marshallese life. But after the Marshallese evaluated, there is a, an objective or subjective evaluation by the people who are bringing the test in. Then we have the green jobs machine, Sharon, thank you so much, um, lending a hand in what kind of analysis can be done. And there are objective evaluations also coming in from um, Argonne National Laboratory, John Hummel's lab, so that we have at least four levels of evaluation for deciding whether something's likely to be useful. We are trying to get ideas from absolutely everywhere. We are being as rigorous as necessary, depending on the kind of thing that is being proposed. The embassy in Maduro from the U.S. is supporting, Singapore is supporting, New Zealand is supporting, um, and the U.S. Office of Naval Research has begun a little bit of support to make sure that this gets a solid foundation, but driven by the Marshallese. The areas that we're looking at are the ones that you would expect plus one or two. So the one that turned out to be most important to the Marshallese, and therefore the one we are listening to most closely, is the idea of cultural preservation. They see that they may lose absolutely everything they have ever known for a hundred generations. And if they have to go somewhere else, they want to be recognized as Marshallese wherever they go. It's not that they necessarily want to preserve an identity that doesn't integrate with their local population. It's just that they want to never lose track of the fact that they have been forced out of somewhere and they want to bring what they can with them. All of the other sectors are familiar, including ecosystem regeneration. And one of the things that we think is most important is job creation because with jobs comes a bit more economic security. With economic security comes choice. So we have an early priority in job creation. When we look at what it is that has made this castle idea into the NGO it is, we borrowed from a lot of people. We have introduced to them, of course, the SDGs. They were already very familiar. There was somebody in the Marshallese government whose entire job it is to help with the SDGs where the Marshallese can. Of course, they are those that are suffering from the impact of global warming. They are not somebody who has done the damage, but still the SDGs are highly desirable. We have talked with Amory Lovins about integrative design, Kate Rayworth at Oxford about donut economics, and so forth and so on. All of the things that you would expect to have as positive influences going into a testing laboratory. We are now soliciting ideas from people around the world that have things that they think might be useful. There have been 58 topics that have been proposed to us so far, and many of them are a little bit too vague, a little bit too foggy, a little bit too far out, and unlikely to be of any use anytime soon. However, some are ready to go right now, and so we have developed a total of 14 venues within Kwajalein Atoll that can allow somebody who has a clever idea to come in and test. Here are a couple of the things that have already come to us and we think in the coming year we're going to be doing something about because it's something that helps the Marshallese directly at an early stage with, among other things, Klaus Schwab's fourth industrial revolution, recognizing when they get somewhere, the Marshallese might want to be good at something that is coming into the digital economy or coming into new methods of manufacturing. We have worked with the University of Wyoming, which has a very strong portable makerspace program because the state of Wyoming in the United States has very few people and only one four-year university, one degree-granting institution. Um, and they have, therefore, put together these makerspaces that can go various places around Wyoming preparing people to come into the university with skills already honed. They have also done something very useful in developing certificates. So in those makerspaces, wherever you are, you can learn skills. You can be tested on those skills and you can gain certificates. And those certificates are acceptable to employers all over Wyoming. We want to do the same thing all over eBuy and any place people from the Marshall Islands might go. We also have a recognition that if you're ill, 
you can't pay much attention in school or anyone else, anywhere else. So they have a lot of water contamination. They have a lot of waterborne disease. So we're bringing in two water systems to test about three months apart. That, these are water systems that are already in use in the Mayan villages of the Yucatan and in the hospitals that are very badly broken inside Yemen. And they'll be coming in early this coming year. We can talk more about that if anybody wishes, but it is a, a NASA technology we think is quite promising. We also recognize that we need to be listening to what the Marshallese have said about preserving who they are as they go various places. One of the things we've already recognized is that Marshallese are being exploited as those who leave early get picked up and somebody does something exploitative to them. You'll see that photograph on the right of somebody washing off his shipmate. Um, that was taken by a colleague of ours in a, an area where Burmese have been enslaved into fishing fleets. Um, and that has come to the attention of the United Nations. And there is a fair amount of effort to try to reduce that enslavement. One of the ways they're doing that is through biometric identification. When a boat goes out and then comes back in again, the same people need to be aboard because what was happening is that people were being worked to death and then thrown overboard and nobody would recognize that when they came back to port. That system that has protected those, marsh those Burmese fishermen were bringing in to help uh, support the Marshallese. For those ideas that do seem to be promising, if the Marshallese like them, if the objective and the subjective evaluations are positive, then we have something we would like to be able to offer that would recognize that kind of achievement. Kauzo Wipan is something that we can talk about further, but basically it's a mark, it's a recognition that if you have done well and the Marshallese who are actually the population you're intending to help think you have done well, this can be awarded. There are a number of groups that are working with us. You can see that we are paying close attention to SDGs 3, 4, 6, and 8 so far, and also 16.9, which is the milestone associated, the target associated with achieving universal identity, so those who are currently invisible can be brought to the fore. Each of those is, uh, logos that is on that screen is an, ad an advantage for the people that are coming in to test, each of those organizations will do better if they aim for those who are most in need. So we think that this is likely to be something that will be deeply appealing for a lot of people. And as I mentioned, we've had 58 recognized uh, proposals come in so far. So if anybody finds anything uh, interesting, um, that is Tico, um, a young man that was following me around that day. Um, he would love you to go to castle.earth, um, the Kwajalein Atoll Sustainability Laboratory, castle.earth, or you can contact me directly. There is my information on the screen, and I look forward to talking with anybody who's interested. Um, thank you, David. I'll go back to you. Wow. Um, that, that was a lot. Very impressive, Eric. Uh, I am going to, if it's okay with you, I'm going to go now to the audience because uh, we've got, well, we're technically supposed to end at three, but I'm going to, <laughs> since we got started late, uh, we will give a little bit more time for audience Q&A. Uh, if someone has a question, if you could just either type in a chat that you've got a question or just raise your hand on Zoom and we will go to you. Yeah, David, this is Aaron. If I may uh, pose a couple of questions here, um, maybe uh, one to uh, Eric and one to uh, Sharon, and uh, my apologies, Sharon, for mispronouncing your name in the beginning. Um, Eric, um, let me actually share the link here with you. Uh, the USTDA just came out with a press release this morning. Uh, this is an initiative that I'm part of. Um, USTDA is uh, going to uh, expand uh, their uh, assistance to the uh, Pacific Islands. Um, I'm part of a group that will organize a, an event in DC in November. Uh, Marshall Islands are part of it. The Federal States of Micronesia is part of it. Palau, as well as uh, adding Papua New Guinea to Solomon Islands and Tonga. Um, you know, you talk about, uh, I guess, the, 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 the question, the, the conversations I was having and helping get this event organized and getting this press release out is, how do you balance 
the development and implementation of local based solutions, particularly of really anything, but whether it's climate change resilience and adaptation or even economic development versus, you know, outsiders coming in and, you know, on the assumption, maybe it's a big assumption of good intentions, but without impeding. Um, you know, to use another exam example is that John Seacrest is actually lives in Seattle. He and I were in Spain together in July looking at Spanish startups. And, you know, a lot of these companies that were looking at, at expanding, of course, were thinking of Latin America or Spanish speaking countries. And, you know, I, I was saying, well, you know, you should be looking at Southeast Asia, you know, which is a high growth market. Mm -hmm. And and again, they've got to lead their development and implementation of their business plan. But as an outsider, if I got in, you know, involved, I would be really pushing of saying, well, you got to change your business plan and you got to be looking this way to mitigate your risk. So kind of a, you know, uh, apples and oranges, but, but how do you, what's some advice or challenges you see when it comes to the, the local uh, uh, push but with outside support, and hmm. then and then uh, uh, I'll leave it there. And if we have time, I'd like to get uh, a question to Sharon. But Eric, to you, please. Sure, absolutely. So one of the things that Peter Diamanda stresses um, in his Singularity talks is that the best way to make a billion dollars is to help a billion people. Um, looking at the bottom of the pyramid, as we have done for the last 15 years, since some very intelligent people began recognizing that there was a market there. Um, and if you price um, your uh, goods appropriately, and if you aim to solve a problem that's a genuine issue, you can wind up making a very great deal of money while doing a very great deal of good. That's the right mindset. Go ahead and have your clever idea. Get your startup moving. But if you intend to do something that is going to help the bottom of the pyramid, come to a place like Casal. Come to a place where those who are actually at the bottom of the pyramid have an opportunity to both evaluate and give feedback to those that are bringing clever ideas in. And then have that recognition, that fact that you have done something good for those at the bottom of the pyramid be recognized by something like Elemental Accelerator. You saw that um, on the screen uh, as one of the logos associated with us. There are groups of people who are willing to take that risk reduction, that recognition that somebody else has done the risk management for them, the due diligence for them, and move that forward as a consequence into greater and greater rounds of funding so that you can get something expanded from somewhere small to somewhere considerably larger. And I agree with you, Southeast Asia is a great market. Um, happy to answer or ask my question to Sharon unless someone else wants to chime in. Hearing none, let me um, see if I can. Uh, so this is an image um, that I use. Uh, I know John Seacrest and I see uh, Catherine Forrest and uh, Abu is on the can't, can't see call. an image. Um, it should come in through now. But this is what I what I created as a the anatomy of the twelve minute pitch it is is you know either for investors to consider investing in uh, a startup or uh, use as a strategy uh, for uh, startups and. And the key element there is the notion of impact. Um, you didn't use the words, Sharon, as ESG, but I'll throw it out there. And, uh, and there's a lot of criticism now. And I, candidly, I think rightfully so. Uh, the, the word greenwashing and ESG. And, you know, and even in this 12-minute pitch, I put the word impact. And people said, well, this is for impact businesses. No, in my mind, every business... Fortune 500 companies, as well as pre-revenue startups, need to be thinking about their impact as applied to either the ESG model or the SDGs. And I'd like to get your feedback, Sharon, about that. We're, we, we, it's great that ESG is becoming the vernacular. I know there's a risk of greenwashing, but, <laughs> but from your perspectives, where do you see, how can we bridge this gap of either impact versus yeah. versus traditional business where impact ESG SDGs becomes more definable, right. measurable, and part of the, you know, of, of the lexicon and business strategy. 
Well, I, you know, I'll go back. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Aaron. I'll go back to, you know, where I started in terms of really uh, starting with a, a critique of how we can better leverage science and technology in terms of the measurement of the, the implementation, the practice, which gets you to the impact that you're talking about. We're very weak in terms of the frameworks for the qualitative measurement. Uh, with respect to the SDGs, it's a problem. Um, and so we've got to get better in terms of understanding what are the tools, what are the practices that actually result in the impact. But I think Lynn said it best, what are you solving for, right? What are we really solving for? So I, I am in favor. I mean, there have been a lot, there's been a lot of movement in the market. The rating agencies are starting to get very serious about the E and the S in ESG which means that businesses are going to have to pay more attention because now you're impacting my access to capital, right? You're rating my paper, you're rate, right? So then we start having a different conversation because see businesses have been having some of the same challenges because the S in ESG has been very kind of wonky. So if you look at the integrated reports, it's like a lot of talk about policy and a lot of stuff but it's not businesses haven't been forced to get real clear about like, what are you actually doing? What are your practices that are resulting in impact? And, and like, how are you measuring that? Again, data, what's the data? So you're going to continue to see us moving towards data that supports an impact story. And so if you look at the history of ESG, it actually grew out of social responsible investing. Right. And then we dropped the S and then it was responsible investing and then it became something else. And then it became something else. And then it was impact investing. And then, it's, and then, and then of course, the UN and then the Europeans got involved well, actually with the Brits. And they said, well, hang on for a second. We need to get some compliance going here. And then that was like the genesis of ESG, which has been all about reporting so that I can carry on with my financial performance, because that's what I really care about, right? So, so I think that ESG has been plagued by some of the same considerations that the SDGs have been plagued by, getting serious about the E and the S. Um, and um, I think that there are some developments in the market that are going to force businesses to not just think about compliance, but to really get serious about the impact story. Um, so I'm actually heartened by the development. I think we're gonna to continue to see some, some pushback from other quarters, but as climate related disasters continue to proliferate, I, don't th I, I think we're gonna to continue to get uh, both, we're gonna see both carrots and sticks get, um, uh, you know, continue to develop in, in interesting ways. All right, thank you. Yeah. So we, we end up having this broad-based discussion, but we don't frame it tightly in terms of the process by which idea turns into scaled business that serves billions. And we use hand-waved around ESG just now. Um, ESG is a thing that people are doing in the advanced public markets that has very, very little to do with the innovation deployment because large companies are, are already deployed in their innovation, shall we say. And so really at the pre-seed and the seed level, there's a different kind of engagement. And so how can we take the work that we're talking about in the castle.earth effort and turn that into stage specific things that can happen that will rapidly move people to um, some level of progress or some level of saying, no, this is not the right thing to do. And I think when Sharon focuses on the question of how do we survive the next whatever period so that we get the sustainable, that that's really an important measure of whether we should be working on a project or not. So mm -hmm. the timeline by which the Marshall Islands are going to be disastrously, disastrously impacted is not 50 years. It will happen far earlier than that. And so then they, they have a really significant, urgent matter to do, right? We don't need lots of great ideas. What we need is a few good enough ideas that get us somewhere. 
um, uh, that gets us close enough to sustainability that we have a place to stand and do the next step. So how do we do that framing? Can, can Sharon, maybe you can pick up on yeah. that? Let me let me let me tell you about one of some of the things that we're doing because you've made a point about the ESG and and I and I and I and I also love where you're going in terms of like how do you take because really the the the, the first answer to the first part of the question which is how do you get things to scale I love that question because I think we need ideas factories to link to incubators to link to accelerators to link to ecosystems that support that's the only way it can happen right? Because otherwise you're uh, stuck you, with- You're not using the words the way that I would use them. So there's certainly okay. a, a, a definitional question, but sure, uh, we, we have to figure out how to create volume of innovation scaling um, that causes ecosystems to build a virtuous cycle yeah. of producing more of that innovation scaling so that we make the transformation. Yeah. And so let's come- a bunch of tools. Yeah. So let's come, let's come back. Let's come back to, so I'm using, I'm using a terminology that's, that's just been used across various asset classes in terms of traditional kinds of approaches. I, 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 I certainly grant that. But the, the point that I'm making is that if we're going to talk about how do we solve and we, and we um, are able to support ideators in places like the Marshall Islands so that they are actually able to scale. So I don't wanna get caught up in the language because I, I think we're trying to get to some place with this. I believe that we're gonna to have to integrate across asset classes. And I think we're gonna to have to be creative as funders, right? Let me come back to the private sector. So one, some of the things that we're doing here in Africa, where I am now, I'm in Cape Town, to go back to the ESG question and funding innovation is we're going into big businesses like insurance companies that are losing a lot of money in terms of paying out catastrophe claims. And we're saying, you've got a lot of money for ESG and you've got a lot of money for CSR and you've got a lot of money for a whole bunch of stuff that you don't think has anything to do with your bottom line. If we can integrate what needs to happen in the communities in which you operate and you can pay for that out of these buckets of money, then you're suddenly unlocking, unleashing capital that should be integrated because it is actually all, which is what you're saying, Aaron, it is actually part of, should have been part of the story in the first place. Businesses should be mindful of the communities in which they operate. It's part of the S. The S and ESG shouldn't be for uh, social, it should be for stakeholders, all stakeholders, including the community. So I think that we need to integrate and have deeper conversations around what is the appropriate funding for an ideator and what is the kind of support that's required in order to scale to a place where you're able to generate wealth and you're able to impact lots of people. Um, and, and so I think that that requires funders to um, be less lazy and a lot less arrogant because you know, we don't have all the answers. And um, I think we need to do what Lynn talked about, which is listen. And then I think we need to collaborate more across the various asset classes um, so that we get appropriate funding that allows it. And right now it's siloed. There's problems with VCs. There's problems with private equity. There is a missing middle. Um, and we keep talking about it, but I think tapping into some of the quote unquote historical ESG funding is, a, is actually a way that we can close the gap. So Sharon, real quick, one question to ask because how to start the, the fire, so to speak. And I know you've been doing things, Len talked about some of the things he's doing, obviously Eric's doing it too. Um, we seem to be in a place where, you know, we, we already talked a little bit about how policy and governance by themselves are, are not sufficient for making the change. It does seem like nonprofits have a place, even though this is also going to be a commercial activity too on the startup side, but it seems like a lot of nonprofits miss the action-oriented part because it's challenging and it's hard. And so I'd be interested in your thoughts because you've obviously done a lot with women entrepreneurs and things like that. What, what would be your recommendation for nonprofits to be more action-oriented in the space working with business as well? I think the biggest challenge that we've had historically across 
say the 14 markets that I've been active in in Sub-Saharan Africa and the markets in emerging Asia where I have experience um, is that nonprofits have a lot of the same challenges that the development finance institutions have. And that's that they're project or they're program focused, mm -hmm. right? And so they're getting funding. They've got a mandate issue. They're getting funding. And the way that they're structured, it has to be in a project where the kinds of challenges that John and Aaron are talking about require systems thinking, right? So they, the, the challenges in what we're trying to solve for are, are complex, right? And so you can't have a project approach to solving a complex challenge, right? You've got to have, you've got to have a mandate that allows you to step in and say, oh, wow. Look at Eric, he's over here doing this great stuff in the Marshall Islands. It's a lot of moving parts, but my mandate only allows me to do this little thing. And so I think we're gonna have to have serious conversations with the investors and the funders of the nonprofits to say, you've got a mandate challenge because business as usual and what, the way that you're, you're putting the handcuffs on and causing people to just focus on projects, it's not working. It hasn't worked. Well said, well said. David, can I, if I may, unless anyone has other questions, but um, I want to maybe try to answer this question from my perspective, because, sure. you know, I got, I mean, you know, I, I've known, I know David Lynn and Eric and Sharon, you and I are just getting uh, to know each other, but, you know, I, I was I was involved with MTN when it was a startup 20 some years ago, and, uh, and, and John knows this, you know, I've got significant business interests in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, the challenge has been, I mean, you know, I do a lot of interest in Uganda, outside of Kampala, and uh, the challenge within the private sector and the nonprofits, and even in Haiti, where I've done a lot of work, um, is information is 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 huge. And now the challenge is we have too much information, and we need, you know, uh, kind of you know, accurate, filtered on the ground information. That's from the private sector to make decisions, to make some decisions that impact long-term strategic issues as well as short-term changes. You know, look in the last 12 months of how the global economy has changed. And so, and, and, and NGOs are really good in that information. You know, they're there on the ground, they're in the trenches and doing that. But there, you know, my experience has been is that the NGOs are so afraid to work for the for-profit, you know, in the collaboration, and only look at the for-profit, you know, and I know I'm being overly generalized, but looking at the for-profit is just a funding mechanism. Um, and, you know, so I see that's challenge number one. I guess that's to you. Do you see that as well? And how do we fix that? And then conversely is that the, the, for profits, I think the private sector needs to do a better job at understanding that value that NGOs brings. Um, but there's just a, I guess the bottom line is a lack of trust. There's just a lack of trust. And it goes back to what John says, you know, making money is not a bad thing. And and Sharon, you know, you didn't use the exact words, but the business roundtable read, you know, redefine whose stakeholder is not just the shareholder. It's it's their customers, it's your employees, it's your you know, uh, uh, other other people. So I guess that's the issue of trust. We're, what's your recommendations on, on how we, we can bridge that gap and, and, uh, and be around trust? So trust is a very good question. I, I've, I've done work on what's called distributed problem solving and, and collective intelligence. When do more people make better decisions? When do more people make less optimal decisions? And how to structure the people, the tech, and the processes? And the first thing they'll say is you've got to have shared goals. You cannot talk about trust if you don't have shared goals up front. And that's a hard work because oftentimes people bring in their own perspective on the problem, what needs to be done. But if you don't have a overarching big tent set of goals, the diversity of participants will fragment you. Uh, the second is recognizing that trust is, is really at the end of the day asking to be vulnerable to someone else that you do not control. Um, and, and that vulnerability is based on, on the fact that you perceive that the other participants act with uh, competence, are they competent? Uh, act with benevolence. Um, they're not just doing self-interested things and they operate with integrity. They do what they say. Uh, 
And, and so if you're trying to create an environment in which it is a environment where new people can come in and you can create an environment of trust, I would say first and foremost, good leadership creates big enough goals that people can see their, their piece of it. And yes, there can then be sub goals that they tackle underneath that. But if you don't do that up front, it will just fragment. And then two, um, you have to think about, you know, are we putting in place norms and demonstrating behaviors that encourage um, folks to show their competence, their benevolence and their integrity, and that we call it out if we don't see that and say, look, you know, we're trying to create the round table, we're trying to create Camelot, not Game of Thrones. Um, and I think that's just the art of leadership. The last thing I would say is um, you do need to have a diversity of perspectives and encourage it. If you force everybody to think the same way, uh, you'll actually lose, you'll lose any benefits of actually doing a Big Ten approach. And with that, we are a little bit past the time. We appreciate everyone staying, but I think we've now hit about the 60 minute mark. Um, I will pause to see if there's one last burning question from anyone in the audience. I think uh, it's oh. well worth our, our while to think about um, the speed of the cultural transformation in that trust engagement, right? Um, everybody, uh, uh, when I go into a new community, they um, say it's very difficult to get people to do X, Y, Z, but I don't need everybody to move. I just need the early, early adopters to move. And so small groups of people can move quickly to address that trust issue. Um, and having a 10 year discussion about how we're supposed to manage our trust discussions is a great way not to hit our deadline on survivability. Absolutely. And I think you're channeling Margaret Mead there, which is never doubt the ability of a small group of people to change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And like you said, I mean, this is channeling what Lynn said, which is um, if you're going to wait for perfect information, you're never going to get anything done. That includes if you're going to wait until the scene is just perfect. And so being able to say, look, we're going to try path A or path B, uh, and we're going to have a revisit phase after X number of months, but we've got to do a pass because otherwise we're going to have paralysis. I'm going to pause real quick though because I thought I saw, uh, and I'm going to I apologize if I mispronounced your name. A Amparo, did you have a question? You seem to be waving at the camera, but I didn't know if you were saying hi or if you had a question and to close before we wrap up. No. Okay. Well, again, thank you all for joining us for this discussion. Thanks to everyone with uh, United Nations General Assembly 77. Thank you, Aaron, for bringing us together. I'll close with the, the, the sort of the channeling that I think you've all heard from Eric, Lynn, and Sharon, which is please be bold, please be brave, and most importantly, be, please be benevolent as we tackle these challenges together. Thanks again. Thank you all. Thank you all.